Welcome to Richmond Seeds Cup of Joe. On this episode, how do conditions affect crops after planting? Dick Moore's 2024 planting guide is available on our website and linked below. Hear from Ben about a new fungicide and our stocking line corn seed treatment and the benefit it provides. Dylan gives insight on factors that can inflict early stress on the plant and herbicide carryover that can affect yield. Ben summarizes an article from Iowa State on bean leaf beetles and how they can reduce your yield. Hi, this is Joe Mershman. Welcome to Mershman Seeds Cup of Joe. Today we have Ben, Lynn, and Dylan, and we're going to start with uh, Lynn. Yeah, so fielding some phone calls this week about uh, the weather conditions here locally, and, and it kind of seemed like we missed, in certain areas, some rain. It looked like at one point in time, you know, from Arkansas to, to Minnesota, we were going to have rain. But some places, uh, particularly in that central Missouri region, west central Missouri, uh, seemed to miss rain. So those guys are hot and heavy, but up here to the north, a lot of rain, you're probably, what, getting over two inches now, accumulation out of, mm -hmm. you know, Monday to Friday, we're one point, probably 1.5. So the questions that I'm getting are, I planted corn over the weekend, am I safe? We had a little bit of adverse weather coming in from a temperature standpoint. We're probably gonna be a little bit on a saturated side. Is everything gonna be okay? And, and to be honest with you, everything that I've went and looked at, we're, we're setting perfectly fine. Uh, from a corn standpoint, with a growing point being below ground, our, our four inch soil temps look to be uh, a very uh, active around that 50 degree mark. We're gonna fall below it, but you know, it's one of those by the morning, seven o'clock in the morning, we're below, by one o'clock in the afternoon, we're above. Um, and, and if we're doing that at the four inch, the two inch level will react much more quicker to that. So I'm not concerned on corn. Um, we did get a picture yesterday of uh, beans emerged in Monroe City, but- uh, Missouri. You know, Missouri. Missouri, yep. Uh, which is an hour and a half from here. So uh, planted on last Friday and was emerged on uh, speculating Thursday, if not maybe even Wednesday afternoon. So when we talk about beans in that aspect, and I know we've kind of talked about this ad nauseum, mm -hmm. as long as we're not getting to 28 degrees for two hours, we're, we're gonna be okay. Uh, and I think down there, they're predicted the low of 36. Uh, they're not even gonna get the freezing temps up here. I, I don't think we're now predicted to get to what 35 34 and it's going to be pretty fleeting so for anyone that's planted uh was 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 progressive had the fields ready to go um i'm i'm pretty confident that we're going to be okay with uh with all the crops that are in now we kind of go into the second evolution is i got a little bit done now i need to get the rest done what do i do when do i you know pull the trigger on the 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 my favorite quote from your dad if 80 percent of the field is ready to go and 20 isn't you go. When, when is that time frame? I think we still have one window on beans that we're going to be able to, to definitely hit. Corn's going to come around pretty quickly as well uh, toward the end of the week. But uh, I, I don't think we're at a position where we need to mud anything in. Um, just pick your, you know, pick your crop that, that the conditions look uh, conducive to. If we're in that 40 to 45 degree soil temp, um, I'm, I'm okay with uh, definitely on beans and even on, uh, you know, our corn, what we know for for germination on, on, on that, we're in a window that we're gonna warm up pretty quick after that, that happens. Cause I think it's like next Thursday, we're gonna start staying above consistently the 50 degree mark on our four inch soil temp, so. But just always remember this, as long as I've been here, there's always two days every year you should not plant, but we don't know those two Correct. days. <laughs> We have some guides, you know, Dick Moore provided us with a planning guide. So if you haven't checked that out on the, the website, do, uh, do look at that. Based on the signs of the moon. Correct. We were just looking before filming, looking at the weather um, and what would be next week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday are very poor days. And uh, we have some, some cold rain coming in on, on that, according to the weather service. So, um, so far right now, Dick, Dick is batting a thousand in my book on uh, what we're sitting at. So. It's one of those, you know, anecdotal things to check out. But uh, right now we're in, we're still in the month of April. We're going to have a window in the month of April. It's not time to panic. Just make sure that your your conditions are fit um, from a wetness standpoint. Temperature, we're going to be fine. So scratch around and make sure those soil conditions. You know, when you're uh, if you're a, a conventional tillage guy, you know, look at that that two two and a half inch depth. Uh, you you know your your tillage floor um, where you're going to be planting that that crop uh, is. You know, doing the mud ball test, uh, making sure that everything looks good. Because what what we are probably going to see, and and it seems like it's kind of been a trend, and for you know some of the folks in Missouri that we talk to, that's just an every year occurrence that we're going to get a little bit of a crust on top. We're going to have some some 
sunlight, wind, a little bit of heat, probably crust off, but then underneath we're going to have a pretty mucky situation going on. So um, as we were just discussing earlier uh, before filming, um, it's not the date that has a lot to do with uh, with yield. It's the conditions that happen afterwards. Mm -hmm. So make sure you're, you know, uh, what probably got guys in trouble a little bit last year with some of the, these very minute problems that we had was there was a day when you should have parked the planter, but it was 72 degrees on, I think, what was our magic day? It was like April 13th or something like that. The extended forecast didn't look great, but it was hard to, to say no when it's 80 degrees and sunny and you have an opportunity in April. So make sure we're looking at that. In particular, you know, when we talk about corn, I mean, that's going to be very important when we look at that uniform fast emergence that we have those growing conditions uh, afterwards that are conducive to get that up out of the ground. And don't forget about our seed treatment on corn, Ben. You might mention the, the additional fungicide that we put in and what it, kind of benefit it shows in these kinds of conditions. Pyraxostrobin is, is a fungicide that uh, it's been proven in like mint fields that when they use this, it actually makes the mint more hardy to, to freezes and stuff like that. So. Um, when we add that fungicide that's not in this year's book, but it's on the website, when we added that into the, the, the seed treatment for corn, we're actually getting a little bit of a, a boost in germination and, and vigor, getting the corn out of the ground when it's cold. So we're protected from multiple multiple facets between the trepidity and the extra the fungicide. So And just how good the quality of the corn was to be. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I don't know that I've ever seen a year where we have this much mid 90s to upper 90s on uh, saturated cold germ scores so phenomenal quality corn yeah so like I say weather looks good ahead get her in the ground yep well dylan you, you got you've been working on something it sounds like yep so um i've read a, I was reading an article about uh possible possible herbicide carryover um with the with all those dry conditions that we we saw in some spots last year that they could be a problem again this year because we had we had no moisture and everything was was kind of at a a, a stalemate essentially it seemed like um, like even pre's and posts weren't working because there was there was nothing there to help um, help those those herbicides work so um, it seems like right now we're off to a a good start with 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 early moisture right now um, but we need to kind of pay attention to those those low fertility, low or high pH areas um, where those where those beans or, or corn um, are are have that, that early that early stress um, that could that could affect them again this year at 24 because everything was so dry um, last year in 23 kind of throughout the throughout the whole season it seemed like some areas were were drier than others of course. Um, but anywhere where either corn or soybeans have a lot of stress, it seems like that's where we're going to see those in those areas. It's not going to be whole whole fields, of course. It's going to be where the most stress or the sprayer had um, some overlap or areas such like that. Yeah, I I read this week that HPPDs in soybeans could be uh, up up this year as far as damage goes. So uh, it doesn't take a lot of um, those types of products to to uh, cause injury on soybeans. So so as you're looking at your crop as it's coming up, you know, keep that in the back of your mind that what herbicide you used uh, could be affecting this year's crop if you were in very dry conditions. Yep. Look at those dark red spots on the drought monitor, and that's probably where you're going to be seeing those those issues. And and you are absolutely correct. You know, um, the HPPDs, like I think the, the the statistic on HPPDs is they're like some form of HPPD um, is used on like 80 percent of the corn growing acres in the United States and that's a higher number in the I states it's even higher than that 80 percent so almost every mix or every blend has a Callisto a Laudus a, a product that balance. has balance yep a, a product that has that mix in the, in the corn game so yeah and we are working uh, on putting uh, HPPD tolerance into our enlist uh, germplasm so I mean it's got to go through regulatory but uh, towards the end of the decade, we'll have that, that into it. So then be less likely to, to have to worry about it because, you know, balance uh, bean uh, when it originally came out was, uh, was a great product to plant in those situations. And what we noticed in research was in areas where, where we had research plots where there was a, a product HPPD put on the previous year and there was carryover, all of those products were at the top of the trials 
which didn't mean they were the best products. This means that they they uh, they definitely overcame the the injury. So uh, it is a big issue because we've seen it in in our plots. Yeah, especially if guys are using HPPD in their pre and their post program. Correct. So if you got like three ounces of Callisto in your pre and three ounces of Callisto in your post, that's going to be where you're. You're seeing issues for sure. Yeah, it's a very, very good herbicides. They're just very persistent. And of course, when you get, we don't get a lot of moisture. It don't break it down. So, so keep that in mind. In certain areas, we do see some piggyback too. Then you know, PPO gets a little bit of the uh, um, brunt of the issues when it comes to that. But you know, when that bean's already subjected to potentially an HPPD carryover, and then we go into cool and wet, and, you know, for a brief moment as that bean's coming through that that PPO layer, it's kind of a uh, um, an unfortunate mixture that we're, we're just subjecting that, that young seedling to a lot of stress from a, from a chemistry standpoint. But uh, as we've talked about, probably ad nauseum, that we have to have those chemistries to make sure that our, our, our fields are, are clean. So when we're, when we're looking at this, you know, making sure that we're as early as possible in our corn application the year before, so that way we're giving ourselves as much time for, for both weather and the time standpoint, because some of them are what tend to... Uh, 10 month plant back on, on some of that. So um, yeah, we're giving ourselves enough time to get that uh, to, to degrade, uh, making sure that we are keeping our fertility up from a standpoint of that we're having healthy plants. Because if we have healthy plants, we can fight through a lot of that, uh, that stress and, and over, overcome some of the issues that we have when it comes to some of those early season stresses that are not related to mother nature. Yep, well, you're absolutely correct. And talking about stress, Iowa State had a nice um, article on bean leaf beetles that I kind of wanted to talk about. Bean leaf beetles is something that we, we look at. We, we, we see some everywhere. We see some pressure at some point in our sales territory every year, but they're never typically at a high enough level to be an economic injury, especially from the first generation of what we're looking at. And uh, Iowa State's article says it's the warmest winter ever means low mortality on bean leaf beetles. So we haven't had this low of a mortality rate since 2012. The, the state of Iowa as an average right now has a 40% mortality and they're usually used to seeing closer in that 70, 80% mortality rates. And the reason for that being is bean leaf beetles, when they overwinter as adults, they have to have temperatures um, less than 15 degree Fahrenheit to be subjected to to die. We didn't have that because of the one week that we got into the teens, um, those, those bean leaf beetles would have been protected by about a foot of snow. Correct. Right. So there's something to keep out on the, the watch for. I'm not as concerned with the first generation as I am the second and or well, I guess I'm not as concerned with the overwintering generation that would be doing the feeding because number one, the insecticide that we use is a systemic, not a contact. As our seed treatment, yeah. And, and our seed treatment. Um, the, the feeding um, is usually cosmetic, but it can vector the uh, bean pod model virus, but what, where the real yield um, loss comes into play is when they start clipping pods. In the, in the fall, in the second generation. So if we can get them under control, keep an eye out for them if they are doing some feeding, if you do some bug bombing early um, to lower those, those, those numbers, um, it may help reduce the amount of population that will be in the second generation. And from firsthand experience, it, it's really hard to see those little buggers. Oh yeah, they, they, they hear you coming and yep. they, they run down in a crack and that's why I say you see the damage, you go, well, I don't see the beetles. And then you, well, they're pretty smart. That's yep, so two years ago locally, uh, we, we had a, a one field. So they overwintered in either alfalfa or CRP that kind of surrounded this field. Um, the, the location that, uh, that sells for us was also a retail location. So they were able to go out and I think they end up spraying a uh, insecticide with the uh, post application and got them all under control. But I uh, was very fortunate to actually, I guess, sneak up on them and, and found a few, but um, it, it is another one of those pests that you just have to look at the damage and make the assumption that it's probably coming based on timing of, of where we're at, that it's coming from that because they're extremely hard to see when, when you're out in the field trying to, trying to scout for it. Right. And, and they're, when they vector that virus, it can create green stems in the fall. So, I mean, um, you know, and again, if, if you eliminate the first generation, your odds of having a second generation are not as good, you know, so. Right. Oh, and that's. It, it's not always fungicide application that causes a green stem, so. Yep. Yes, nope, you're absolutely 
correct on that one. The only other thing that I wanted to mention about bean leaf beetles is uh, it's something that you really need to watch for if you are a seed grower or if you were selling into a premium market because uh, once Not, you get that non-GMO type yep, thing, yep. Yep, once you get that purple staining on the outside edge, the, the, the seed is not worth as much money to the guys that are going towards that, that end market of uh, eventually becoming food. And then from a seed grower standpoint, um, from our standpoint is you don't want um, you don't want any breaches into that seed coat that may cause damage. So the threshold is actually lower for spraying them uh, in uh, in a in a food grade market or a, a seed seed production market. Yep, you're absolutely correct. So anything else? You guys tough enough to take these jokes this week? So I got four of them, and I mean I told before we started filming it, I said these are really bad. So, <laughs> okay, so I just want to prepare the audience, you know. Just tighten that seat belt up a little bit, you know, because uh, it's going to be tough. Okay, I got an email saying that Google Maps can read maps backward. It was obviously spam. S P A M M A P S. Okay, if you're dyslexic, I'm sure you got that one right away. Okay, okay. Some ancient Egyptians claim there were no crocodiles in their country. I think they were in denial. Mm. Nile River, you know, okay, mm -hmm. all right. I don't know if you knew this or not, but my son likes elevators. My daughter likes escalators. They are raised differently. <laughs> okay. All right, this is, this is the grand finale. I think this one's probably the only good one in the bunch, okay? Mother Nature originally planned to use wasp to pollinate flowers. Eventually, she went to plan B. <laughs> you can only hold it back so long, right, Ben? Yep. <laughs> but anyhow, thanks for watching today. We, we hope your planting season is going along well. We hope your family is safe, and we sincerely appreciate your business. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.